Well, today we're going to be in uh, Philippians chapter 2, and this will be the third message in this series of sermons, and uh, I've titled the message, If Then. And the reason I, I do that is because Paul gives us a couple of ifs and then a few thens. But when, the way Paul uses the word if here, it's since, S-I-N-C-E. So if you think about he gives us some sense that way, S-I-N-C-E, then we ought to have the spiritual sense, S-E-N-S-E, -E, to do what he's telling us to do. Okay, so listen as I read the first four verses of chapter 2 of Paul's letter to the Philippians. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So in this section of scripture, Paul begins with a state, statement, if there is any consolation, or since there is consolation in Christ, since there's comfort of love, since there's fellowship of the Spirit, since there is affection and mercy. So let's look at this. If there is any consolation... When I read that, the verse over in 2 Thessalonians, when Paul is writing to that church in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, he said, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and word. So there is consolation, and that's what Paul is wanting to call to their minds, that there is this there is this encouragement that we have in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And Paul also spoke about that in his letter to the church at Ephesus, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Paul said, I encourage you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace." You know, I find a lot of consolation and encouragement when I read the scriptures. You know, and what I do a lot of times is when I go through and I read a passage of scripture and a word jumps out at me, I go through and I want to look at where, where that word appears elsewhere in the Bible. And you can see that theme and you can learn from it. And I, I have probably mentioned this to you before, but I like to use Bible Gateway as a study tool. And I can just, it's got the, the search bar there, and I can type in encouragement, and then I can tell, for it to, tell it to search for it in the King James, the New King James, the New International Version, the New uh, English Translation, or whatever version I want. I can tell it to search for that word, and then I'll get a list of where it is in every book of the Bible. And then I can go back and read it and see how it was used. And, and I find a lot of consolation and encouragement when I read that. And one thing that encourages me, you know, we have a tendency that we, we set Paul and Peter and James and John on a pedestal and think, man, those guys were super Christians. But they weren't. They were every bit as normal as we all, uh, we all are, and they had their frailties just like we do. They stumbled and fell. And if there was one of them that stumbled and fell more than any other, it was Peter. You know, he was so self-assured, but yet God, uh, Jesus kept picking him up and using him again and encouraging him and mentoring him to the point that he was the one that was used to preach that marvelous message on the day of Pentecost when thousands of people were saved. So if God, you know, I keep telling myself, if God can use somebody like Peter, he can use somebody like me. What was Peter before he got right with God? A lying, cussing fisherman. You know, and most, most guys that fish are liars. I mean, because they don't catch fish. Every time they catch a, tell the story, it went from here to here to here. You know, and I tell people I caught one this big, you, you know, kind, kind of in between here somewhere. So, but uh, if, uh, you know, seriously, if God could use them, he could use us. Because they were just ordinary guys who did extraordinary things because they yielded their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what we can do. So I find that encouragement and that consolation. And then Paul went on to say, if there's any comfort of love. Now listen as I read out of 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 through 4. This is a wonderful passage of scripture. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. You get that? Paul said when he wrote to the Philippians, if there is any comfort or love, or since there is comfort of love, and then when he tells the church at, uh, at Corinth, God is the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. When we are hurting, when we're facing a trial or a tragedy, God wants to comfort us. And you know, that's one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. That he comes alongside, the word for the Holy Spirit a lot of times uh, is, is the paraclete. That he comes along beside us to walk in step with us, to help bear our burdens, to comfort us in the tough times. And, and, and he's the God of all comfort. Now I want you to understand something. The fact that God is the God of all comfort does not mean you're going to live a life that's a bed of roses. It's not that God will save us from problems, but that God will be present when we have our problems and make it that much easier. And that's another thing I like about the Bible when I find encouragement is I can go through and see how God sustained other people in all their trials and tragedies and and, and, uh, and all the heartaches that they had. A classic example is Joseph. His brothers sold him into prison. I mean, they were going to kill him, but the older brother said, no, he's our brother. Let's do something more loving. We'll just sell him as a slave, you know. And uh, then he ended up in, in, in uh, a top man in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife told a lie, and he was thrown into jail, and then he interpreted a dream for the, uh, for the butler, and... Uh, and the baker, and they forgot about him, you know, and did not reveal, uh, you know, the, the, the sense of what he did for them. And then Pharaoh started to dream, and finally Joseph got out of prison when he could interpret that. But time and time and time again, he would rise to a place of prominence, and he would be slapped down through no fault of his own. And we can look at different places in the Bible, and we can see where people failed, but God picked them up, and comforted them in their heartache and sustained them with his love. And the God of all comfort. Listen as I read John 13, verses 34 and 35. One of, my fa one of the favorite passages of mine. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. Now, he's the God of all comfort. And he's wanting us to love one another. How? As I loved you that you love one another. By this we'll all know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. We are to be a comforting presence wherever we are. And we comfort in different ways. You know, when, when you were raised, you probably found comfort from your dad in one way and comfort from your mother in another way. And we all have gifts, talents, and abilities, and we interact with people in different ways. Uh, that's... Uh, you know, I told you in a prayer time about my neighbor coming across the street and telling us about his wife dying. You, you, know, I, you know, my first reaction was I, I reached out and put my hand on his shoulder. And I talked to him and, and, uh, and you know, and, and I said, can I pray for you? But we need to make ourselves available to people when they're hurting. And sometimes it's not what we say. But it's that hand on the shoulder, it's the shake of a hand, it's a hug. Or it's just being present so they know that somebody is there who is hearing them and somebody that can help them while their heart is aching. Then Paul went on to say, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit. Listen what John said in 1 John, verses 1 through, uh, 1 John 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and made known, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So John is giving us the basis of what he knows and how he knew it. Then in verse number three, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. Why? Why is he doing that? That you also may have fellowship with us. 
He said, this is the basis of our fellowship with one another. And he said, truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. You want to have joy and fellowship with God? The fellowship with the Spirit? Believe what the Bible says. Apply that to your life. And John says your joy will be full. Now, in the fellowship of the Spirit, you know, we... As I was preparing this, you know, there's really a vertical dimension and a horizontal dimension. This cross right over here over my left shoulder, it's got a vertical dimension and a horizontal dimension. And when we think about it, that vertical dimension of the cross is when Jesus died to save us and to make fellowship with God possible. That horizontal dimension of the cross is once we become Christians, we're to have fellowship with the household of believers, the household of Christ. And that's how the church thrives and that's how the church grows. John went on to say that this is the message we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. You see, that vertical relationship has to be right with God so that we can live in the light instead of the darkness on that horizontal plane. But he went on to say, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. Then John, or excuse me, Paul said when he wrote that letter to the Philippians, if there's any affection and mercy now you probably know by now that i really like the book of psalms i read it a lot i read it almost daily uh and then psalm 86 5 for you O lord are good and forgiving abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you that's the affection and mercy of god is what we're seeing there god wants to extend his love and mercy in our lives okay and, and so we do have that fellowship. We do have that affection and that mercy. In Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7, but God being rich in mercy, and I like the way Paul writes that, not that God just has mercy, but God is rich in mercy. You know, it used to be if somebody had some money on them, we'd say they were flush. Well, God is flush with mercy. Why? Because of the great love which he has loved us. He's rich in that mercy, and we experience it through the love of Jesus Christ, that love that took him to the cross. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he's made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And raised up with him and seated. He seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he may, and listen to this, he may show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You know, I've asked several people over uh, uh, the last couple of days, how much rain did you get? You know, people ask me that. And I said, well, in that first bound, I had about eight, eight tenths, and, and, and then on, on Saturday, I had, three, I had three inches. But there was a rain earlier in the year when somebody said, how much rain did you have? And I said, I don't know. It overflowed my gauge and continued to pour and pour and pour and overflow it. And that's what we have here when we're talking about the immeasurable riches of God's grace, of God's affection, and God's mercy. We can't weigh it. We can't number it. You know, uh, we can't gauge it because it is immeasurable and it is ours. Now, Paul went on in the second verse, and he said, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, then fulfill my joy, he said. You know, and, and that's, that, that shows some personal responsibility on our part. He was putting that responsibility on those believers. Grow up in Jesus Christ. And one of the ways he said to do that is to be like-minded. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, Peter wrote, All of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Now, I think this being courteous and being tender-hearted, let me tell you a story. I read this yesterday and saw the picture. And if you, uh, I posted it on Facebook, so you probably have seen it already. 
But there, I don't know what town this happened in, but there was a little boy who had an old beat-up bicycle and was riding it, and it didn't have any brakes, and he crashed into the side of this older gentleman's vehicle. Older gentleman, the guy looked about my age, you know, but uh, I remember when I thought he was an older, older gentleman. Uh, and, uh, and so the, that older gentleman showed up a couple of days later with a brand new bicycle and gave it to the boy that had crashed into his vehicle. And the little guy, you can see he's crying in the picture and trying to dry his tears. And, and, and his, his buddies standing back over here are just kind of awestruck that this man has done that. That's being tenderhearted. That's being tenderhearted. The boy didn't mean to do it. And the man really changed that boy's life. I, I would imagine that young kid will remember that the rest of his life. And you know, we are living in a calloused world, much too hard-hearted. And we need to remember to be tender-hearted if we're going to truly reflect the love of Christ to this lost and dying world. And then Paul said, then fulfill my joy by having the same love. In Romans 12, verses 9 through 10, let love be without hypocrisy. And you know, you can kind of tell if, that, if there's hypocrisy about that love. And I won't tell you where this happened the other day, but... Uh, uh, I was trying to help somebody out and took this individual in to see a financial counselor. And, and I really had trouble staying in the same office because the guy was trying to be, was so fake with this sentimentalism, you know. And, and uh, but you can tell if that love is genuine. That little boy knew that guy's uh, tenderheartedness was, gen uh, was genuine when he gave him that bicycle. But Paul said, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Now, let me tell you what abhorring evil looks like. My younger brother, Buster, could not eat a green vegetable. And, and whenever we had green beans, what, uh, all my parents had to do was say, Buster, and this, this was the routine. I mean, there were eight of us kids, and so we had to eat what was on our plate. And the pop would say, eat a little bit every time, and you'll learn to like it. And if you would argue with him, he would say, you'd be surprised what you could eat if you were starving. And he knew because he'd been a POW camp. But uh, here's what abhor what evil is. Buster would just reach in, and he'd get one green bean and put it on his plate. And then when he opened his eyes, he would start gagging. And that ought to be how we are when it's about evil. It just it just gets us in the gut is something that we cannot stand and that we want absolutely no part of it and cling to what is good. If we had chocolate cake and homemade ice cream, all of us kids were dipping that up. You know, we were wanting to hang on to that. So we cling to what's good. We abhor what is evil. And notice what else he says. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor giving preference to one another. We need to lift each other up that way. Now, I want to read the same verse for you out of uh, the way J.B. Phillips translates it. Let us have no imitation, Christian love. Let us have a genuine break with evil and a real devotion to good. Let us have real warm affection for one another as between brothers and a willingness to let the other man have the credit. Now, that's a pretty good translation. But when he says a real warm affection as between brothers... He probably didn't live in the basement with, with me and my brother so because sometimes we, our, our affection for one another wasn't real close uh, unless somebody else entered the picture and started giving one of the brothers a hard time. But uh, I think that's a good. No imitation Christian love, a genuine break with evil, and devotion to what is good. Then Paul went on to say we've had our ifs, if, if, if. Now here's the then. Then fulfill my joy by being of one accord. And of one mind. Now, earlier he'd spoke about being like-minded, but we're going to be of one accord and one mind. That means we will all be like clocks and strike at the same moment. Now, I've, if you've ever been in a house that had several cuckoo clocks and they all strike at the same moment, that's very interesting to hear. But I've been in some houses that you'll have a cuckoo clock go, and then a few minutes later, another one go, and another one, another one go. But he's saying what that word means is like clocks that strike at the same moment, and there is power in that. 
and there's testimony in that. And it's something that God can use when we work together in harmony towards a common goal. You know, there's an old cliche, and some people said that uh, St. Augustine came up with this, but I've read uh, other people that disagree and said it was some other church father. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberties. In all things, charity. But the basis of unity is truth. And that truth is what we get from God's word. You know, there are some people that believe truth is relative and subjective, and there's others that believe truth is absolute, and it's based on the character of God and the integrity of his scriptures. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And I believe that with all my heart and all my soul. Because when I heard the preaching of God's word and when I read God's word for myself, I realized I was a sinner in the need of a savior and there was a freedom there when I gave my life to Jesus Christ that I had never known before and a satisfaction that the world could not give me. But he said, my word is truth. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, Paul said, every scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the person dedicated to God may be capable and equipped for every good work. God gives us what we need in his word to live his life and to obey his commands. And then Paul said, Then let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Nothing done through selfish ambition or conceit. You know, we're living in a my, my, my world, and we want ours right now. This is the opposite of being of one accord and of one mind. And notice the structure of the verse. It does not say ambition is selfish. There's, but he says there is selfish ambition. But ambition itself is not selfish. There's nothing wrong with the right kind of ambition when it's focused on glorifying God and serving him with our God-given gifts, talents, and abilities. But American culture is afflicted with a pervasive sense of entitlement. Far too many people believe, I'm entitled to live a happy and carefree life free of all restraints. Or I'm entitled to possess whatever I desire, whether I can afford it or not. And if it isn't provided for me, I'll just take it. Others believe I'm entitled to have the perfect job, to live where I want, to be paid a high salary on the first day on the job. Entitlement creates an inward, self-focused, self-centered person who is full of conceit. And conceit is an excessively favorable opinion of one's own ability and importance. And Paul said we're to have no selfish ambition. And people that are in that, that are afflicted with this mindset are out of step with God. Romans 121 says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. In Proverbs 26, 12, it says, Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool. Than for him. Then in Jeremiah 9, verses 23 through 24, let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. He wants us to glorify him and give him the credit instead of walking about with a haughty spirit and the wrong kind of ambition. He said, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And when we do this, this is the opposite of conceit. In 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul said, this saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now notice his lowliness of mind. And I'm the worst of them. He said, I'm the worst sinner of all. Then over in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, Paul said, I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. 
Paul was a very bold individual, but he was marked by humility as well. He had no room for conceit, and he surrendered his, his life, his desires, that, the, that Christ could do his work in him and through him. The world thinks the biblical perspective is defective when it comes to the issues of strength and weakness. The world thinks that those who are strong should use their strength to take advantage of the weak. The vulnerability of another is seen as an opportunity for strong gain at the expense of the weak. This paradigm isn't worth a plug nickel and it'll make you a moral misfit. Evidence of this has been seen in recent days in Afghanistan through the atrocities of the Taliban and ISIS. They're taking advantage of the weak. And I won't even go into all the atrocities because I don't want to sicken your stomach, but I've been doing a lot of reading on it. And, and they want to use their power to oppress. Instead of taking advantage of the weak, Christ calls us to minister to them. Paul said to look out not just for our own interests, but also for the interests of others. And when I think of Paul's statement there, what James wrote in his first chapter stands out. James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their adversity and keep oneself unstained by the world. James is in harmony with Paul. He calls us to look out not just for our own interest, for the interest of the orphans and the widows and those who are in need. In Psalm 68.5, we're reminded that God is a father to the fatherless and an advocate for widows, and God rules from his holy dwelling place. Then in Galatians 6, verses 2 and 10, Paul admonishes us to carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Whenever we have an opportunity, Paul said, let us do good to all people and especially to those who belong to the family of faith. This is what God calls us to do. Not to turn a blind eye or a deaf ear to the needs of other people, but to be present. To reach out and minister them into their in their times of need. And then people can see the love of Christ in us and they'll say, they've got something I don't have and I want it. Well, Father, as we come now in Jesus' name, I thank you, Father, for this if-then equation that Paul shared with the church at Philippi. And, Father, may we read it, may we heed it, may we practice it and make it a habit in our lives, Father, to live a life that's pleasing to you, Father, that we might be functional, that we might be useful to you, Father, as we live this life on earth and touch the lives of others and hopefully bring them to the cross of Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we have a song of invitation. We invite you to come today, whatever you need might be.